if Yeshua is not centered to our worship, centered to our lives, then we're only busy with religion. And then we should stop it. And so when we sing, come Yeshua, come, we invite him to every facet of our lives. In the morning, in the evening, when we wake up, when we go to sleep, every facet thereof. Because we are betrothed to him and we are clothed by him. So this week's Torah portion, Mishpatim, that runs Exodus 21 to 24, builds on Yitro, the one of last week, Exodus 18, 19, and 20, and it runs over to next week's. And so we're going to do it as a little bit of a package. The one started last week. Going to do this week. But this week and next week is going to be very is close connected. So next week's heading is also betrothed and clothed, but version 2. Because we're going to look at this week's Torah portion, Exodus 21 to 24, with the emphasis on 24. This week through the eyes of the book of Revelations. Next week through the eyes of Paul. Two lenses to look at this week's portion. The Revelations lens. Come, Yeshua. Come. And the lens of Paul. And we're going to see that Moses, John in the Revelations, and Paul are talking the same language. No tension at all. Because core and center to that is Yeshua. And he has said that a kingdom divided is a kingdom that will fall. So how can he be divided? How can his word be divided? If his word is divided, then his kingdom will fall. Meanwhile, the kingdom of darkness is divided. So we see many, let's call it, forces of darkness or principalities of darkness or agents of darkness in operation today. And it's like a bit of confusing because there are all these warring parties and these warring factions in the world. Who is who in the zoo? Different agents of darkness which means that the kingdom of darkness will fall. And our Messiah's kingdom is united in his word through him, our Messiah. So when we sing, come Lord Jesus, come, bow Yeshua, bow Yeshua, come Jesus, Yeshua, come, we are un- saying, let your kingdom be united through your word. And we betrothed and clothed by him. So this week we're going to look at Mishpatim, Exodus 21 to 24, with the emphasis on 24. But we're going to look through through the eyes of revelations. After this I looked and I saw a door. After this meaning Revelations 2 and 3, where he had the vision of the seven churches. So after he had that vision of the seven churches, I looked and saw a door having been opened in the heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking to me, saying, Come up here and I'll show you what has to take place after this. And immediately I came to be in the Spirit, and I saw the throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And then an elaboration thereof, jumping into Revelations 5. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll, the Greek word biblion. Everybody with a biblion in his hand, please show it to us. A biblion. So if you ever wondered where the word Bible came from, 
you've got a biblion in your hand. The Afrikaans is actually quite telling. Where you go and you say, on sal boeken vat. Because what do you do? It's a practice that's, I don't know how many of you still practice it, but in years past you had this boeken vat ceremony in the evenings. With the evening devotion. And you took the Bible and you read from it. You took the Biblion. And he took the Biblion, the Hebrew Sefer, written inside and on, on the back, having been sealed with seven uh, seals. And I saw a strong messenger proclaiming with a loud voice, saying, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loosen its seals? And no one in the heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the Biblion or to look at it. And I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read from the Biblion or to look at it. And one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See. Come, Yeshua. Come. Open the Biblion for us. So when we sing that, so when we praise and worship our Master, our Messiah, we are being united with this. When we are going to read the verses of Exodus 21 to 24 and some others as well, we'll see the fingerprints of what we've just read here. So before digging into that, just a short detour to emphasis, to put an emphasis on the importance of books. What does Biblion mean? Or Sefer? Sefer in in the Hebrew. So right from the start, we see this concept of a book taking a very prominent role throughout scripture. This is the book of the generations of Adam. A book that established the identity and being and purpose of Adam. Because his identity and his purpose was written up and is engraved in and entangled with his generations. It's basically his generations that gave purpose to him and his identity. The book of the generations of our master Messiah Yeshua son of David, son of Abraham, establishing his identity, his purpose, his calling, and his role on earth, as it has been written into a book. For it has been written in the book of the Psalms, in other words, it's been established by other people as well. And I also ask you, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the good news, whose names are in the book of life. Mm, the book of life. Who would like to be in that book of life? Yeah, would like to be in that book of life? Yeah, I sure do. If you're not there, then you're in the other book. <laughs> Which is not a good book. <laughs> so let's just say, yes, we would like to be in that book. Book of life. And then the pinnacle of that Revelations 20. And I saw a great white throne and him who was sitting on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead small great standing before the throne and the books, plural, were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, the same one that we spoke, that we've read from Philippians. And the dead were just from what was written in the books, the plural. You and I, we have a book. Every person in life has got a book. Imagine having a GoPro that watches you every moment in the morning, evening, and day. There's a GoPro focused just on you. And the GoPro is recording everything. Except that it's not just recording your actions and your words, it's also recording your Emotions, your thoughts, your feelings, everything is being recorded by that GoPro and goes into that book. And they are being judged from what has been written in the books 
according to their works. And if everyone was not written in the book of life, the other book, the second book, he was thrown into the lake of fire. How important are books? Pretty important. So a book, a sefer means, it's a recounting, a record, a story, a register, provides evidence, a decree, a legal document, and or a deed. So the word book in scripture refers to, and is the evidence or documentation of, the legally enforceable substance and weight of a matter. So, you don't discard books. There's a library full of books. Lois started a series on books. And in the book, there's a weight and the substance and the evidence of what has been recorded. To provide the proof of what has happened. So, I provide this little bit of background. I'll come back to the importance of books a little later. First, another detour, and then we'll get to bring the two streams together. Context. If we forget context when we read individual scriptures or sections or chapters or verses, then we might lose sight of the bigger picture. So we're busy with the book of Exodus, and we started in chapter 1, Israel's increase in Egypt and Pharaoh's oppression of, of our fathers. Therefore, thereafter, history of Moses and his calling, Moses and Pharaoh and the plagues, chapters 1 to 9. But then, Exodus 11 to 15, plague 10 and the Passover, unleavened bread, crossing of the Red Sea of Reeds. 16 to 18, the early journey through the wilderness, the manna, the quail, the waters, Amalek's defeat, and Yetro. And then in the middle of the book of Exodus, Sinai, preparation for and the giving of the ten great words, the covenant, and Shavuot, right at the center. That's followed by Moses receiving the instructions concerning the design of the tabernacle. We're going to come back to this, but let me just drop a teasing question. Why, right after the ten words, the covenant and Shavuot, the instructions regarding the design of the tabernacle, could they be related? Shavuot and the design of the tabernacle, could that be related? Then in chapter 32, 33, the golden calf, the setting aside of the tribe of Levi. 34, the covenant renewed and the new tablets. And in 35 to 40, the construction and the dedication of the tabernacle and our Father and His glory that um, sort of um, appears and take entrance and habit take habitat dwells with, uh, with our fathers in the tabernacle, where his glory fills the tabernacle. The process from Exodus 11 to 40 is one year. You see that in Exodus 40 verse 70. That's one year. The first 10 verses are 10 chapters. We don't know how long that took. But there's a lot of things that happened in that one year. If you think about it, when we start in Exodus 1, they're this scattered group of people that's, in a sense, leaderless. They fight with Moses. They're slaves. They're disorganized. And gradually, they've been molded through a variety of processes to a point where Father can actually dwell with them. Very often we may ask and say, may you and your glory be with us. It's like aiming for chapter 40, but not wanting to go through the preceding chapters. 
You cannot pray for chapter 40 and, your, and his glory to be with us if you don't go through these different steps, which includes a tabernacle, which includes a covenant, which includes a lot of testing. Yeah, it includes a few mistakes as well, like golden calves. But then the management thereof. How do we deal with those golden calves? So yes, we really would like to have the Father's glory with us and with his tabernacle and dwell with us permanently. But if we forget how that came about and where this is provides us with a nice template, guidance, teaching, then we will miss it. And so our fathers have been prepared for this glory of our Father to dwell with them through these different steps. We can even call them like thresholds. Johan and I had a fantastic discussion about a week and a half ago about the concept of thresholds and what it means to go through thresholds. And Father will take us to different thresholds in our lives and we may say, oh, it's so heavy, oh, it's so bad, it's so, um, the burdens are incredible. Perhaps it's a threshold of testing, a threshold of cleaning, a threshold of learning and, and learning something about the Father through which we have to go. And as we cr cross over that threshold, it's closer to the glory of our Father. A a while ago, I did a series on the covenants, this set of covenants of our Father. And with respect to the covenant through and with Moses, I had this slide. And it refers to this week's Torah portion. That's where the covenant is confirmed with Moses. It's this week's Torah portion. The covenantal parties. Abba Father, Moses, Aaron, his son, the seventy elders, and through them the entire house of Israel and with us going forward. Why am I mentioning this? If we go back, the Passover, there's no covenant there. The covenant of Passover is referring to the covenant with our Master Yeshua. The covenant with Moses is this week's covenant, and it deals with Shavuot. Because this is what is happening this week. We're celebrating and commemorating the giving of the Torah and what happens after that. So how important is Shavuot? Very important. Because we're not in the yearly cycle of Shavuot yet, we're anticipating and preparing for Passover, we might get this too confused. We might actually link this to Passover, where it's not linked to Passover, it's linked to Shavuot. So let's read Exodus 19, just a few verses. It's just to take the lead from last week. And you've seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. And now if you diligently obey my voice and shall guard my covenant, then I shall be a, then you shall be my treasured possession above all the peoples for all the earth is mine. And you shall be my kingdom of priests, my reign of priests and set apart nation. Those are the words which you have, uh, are to speak to the children of Israel. And Moses came down called for the elders of the people and said before them these words which our fathers commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, Yes, we do. What our father has spoken, we shall do. So Moses brought back the words to the people, uh, of the people to our father. Which, I think, should be very evident and everybody should be aware of the fact that Peter is quoting this in 1 Peter 2. 
where he says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, to set apart nation, a people for a possession, that you should proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And Peter is quoting Exodus 19. But then we go into chapter 20. And our father Elohim, he spoke all these words, we received the ten words. After the ten words, the following. And all the people saw the thunders, the lightning flashes, the sound of a ram's horn. And the mountain smoking. And the people saw it, and they trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, You speak to us. And we hear, but let not Elohim speak with us, lest we die. I think the weight of that moment was so much that they just could not bear that glory of him. And they asked Moses to, uh, to intervene, to speak to them. But the implication is, that when the giver of Torah speaks to Moses, he speaks not to Moses only, but to everybody. But he is asking Moses to stand in the gap there for them. So he spoke to Moses. But we might easily be forgiven to say, oh, but he spoke to Moses, his words to Moses. No. It was the placeholder because the people said, we can't bear this. Go listen and we will do. Be this... Um, intermediary for us but he's speaking all these words to all of Israel Moses just the, the mediator and he continues and Moses said to the people do not fear for Elohim has come to prove you what did we say about thresholds drawing nearer to the father being tested but that is actually, if we say and we pray and we ask, let your glory fill us, let us see your glory, let us be in, enveloped with the weight of your presence, well then we have to be going through this testing as well, to be in the process of purification, to prove you in order that this fear be before you, so that you do not sin. So the people stood at a distance, but Moshe drew near in the fleet darkness when Elohim was. And Jehovah said to Moses, Say this to the children of Israel. Say this to the kingdom of priests. Say this to the set apart nation. Because remember, it's the same people than chapter 19. Because in chapter 19, they were the kingdom of priests or the reign of priests, a set apart nation. So he said, Say this to the set apart nation. You yourself have been have seen what I have spoken to you from the heavens. And then into the start of chapter 21 that says, that reads, And these are the Mishpatim, the right rulings, which you are to set before them. In other words, taking it into context, he says, You are set apart people, kingdom of priests, these are my words, I'll speak to you through, the, through Moses, but you still are a kingdom of priests, a reign of priests, a set-apart nations. I've just given you my ten words and put before them, that kingdom of priests, my mishpati, my right rulings, to which you by incidentally have said, we will do everything. And then chapter 21 to 23 deals with a whole series of topics. Hebrew slavery and bond servants, restitution, arra arrangements in case of damages, norms of social justice, good governance, and how to maintain good neighborly relationships. Ev everything about love your neighbor. And then the Shabbat, the festivals, and idolatry. Love your father. And what that means, love your neighbor, love your father, in a great deal of detail. And then we get to chapter 24. A huge chapter, which I'm sure you have memorized by now, and that in Hebrew. 
So we're going to read most of, most of it. And, uh, and to Moses he said, Come up to Jehovah, you and Aaron, Nadav, Avinu, and the seventy of the elders of Israel, and you shall bow yourselves from a distance. But Moshe shall draw near to Jehovah by himself, and let them not draw near, nor let the people go up with him. And Moses came and related to the people what the words of our father was, and all the right rulings. What was those right rulings? Chapters 1, 20, 21, 22, 23. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which our Father has spoken we shall do. So now he's speaking to the 70 elders, the Nadav, Avinu, Aaron, and um, the, the leaders. The leaders who are representing the kingdom of priests. And the leaders are repeating those words that we've just read in Exodus 19. It says, whatever you are saying, we shall do. But they're not just the leaders of the kingdom of priests that are standing there representing the old house of Israel, all of them. They're also representing the 70. What is the relevance of 70? All the nations. Genesis 10. And the leaders of the reign of the priests representing all people. There was one of them that represented me and represented you that said yes that day. Don't know which one. One of them. So when we continue reading this, we have to realize that it's very personal. Because you and I, we were there. Somebody stood in the gap for us, for me and for you, on that mountain, and said yes for that. And Moshe wrote down all the words of our father. What was he writing down? Chapter 21, chapter 22, chapter 23. When you write something down, where does it go into? Into a book. Wrote down all the words of her father and rose up early the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and the twelve standing columns for the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel and they offered burnt offerings and slaughtered peace, uh, peace slaughterings of bulls to our father. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in the basins and half of the blood is sprinkled on the altar. But here we have to stop the printing presses. Moses and the young men are not Levite priests. Moses is a Levite, yes, but he's not a Levite priest. Levite priests, Aaron and Aaron's descendants, not Moses. So how could they do this? How could they do this if they're not Levites? Well, not, not Levite priests. Let me be, be specific. Going to address this question very shortly. But it's a key question in trying to get to the, the, the depth of what our Father is trying to communicate to us through chapter 24. is by realizing that they are not Levite priests. And he took the book of the covenant, that which is just written, and read in the hearing of the people, and they said, All that our Father has spoken we shall do, and obey. And Moshe took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, See, the blood of the covenant which Jehovah has spoken with you concerning all these words. As I've mentioned earlier, this is in the context of Shavuot, the giving of the Torah, and later then the Ruach HaKadosh. And this is where a huge thing comes together around the giving of the covenant. And Moses went up, also Aaron and Nadav and Avinu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and they saw Elohim of Israel, and under his feet like paved work of sapphire stone, and like the heavens for brightness. And we have to ask ourselves why they saw that. 
Because we also read those words in Revelation 21. We are already longing for Revelation 21 and to be in the presence of our Father with the weight and everything with it. We're waiting for the Revelation 21 period. Remember, Revelation 21 is towards the end of your Biblion. That's after all the hiccups of chapters 13, 14, and 15. They already saw it. They were already there. They already experienced everything. And just for good measure, another we shall do and obey. A third one. And he did not stretch out his hand against the chiefs of the children of Israel, and they saw Elohim, and they ate, and they drank, which comes and repeated, and quote, been quoted in Acts 10. Quoting from what and how they've experienced the interaction and the engagement with our Messiah. It's the precise words. And they saw Elohim, and they ate and drank. And Jehovah said to Moshe, come up to me and the mountain and be there while I give you tablets of stone and the Torah and the commandments which I have written to teach them. And the esteem, the glory of our Father, dwelt on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered for six days and on the seventh day he called to Moshe out of the midst of the cloud. And basically... Conclude that section with, And the appearance of the esteem of Jehovah was like a consuming fire, which has been quoted in Hebrews 12. The New Testament writers, quoting chapter 24, time and time and time again. What makes you think that the New Testament writers thought that chapter 24 is an important chapter? If they thought that chapter 24 was something to be done away with, they would not have quoted from it. Not this, at least. And the appearance of the esteem of Jehovah was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountains before the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moshe went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain and came to be that Moshe was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. We have to realize that when the New Testament writers, authors, are quoting something like that, they're not just quoting those words. They're quoting the entire context of where that words, those words are coming from. They're telling the audience, these words come from Exodus 19 to 24, which is a package. Everything that I'm saying has got bearing and comes from and draw upon those words. And everything that has happened there, we all know, and it's not new territory, you're well familiar with it, happens within the context of an engagement ceremony. With a mountain covered in smoke and all of it acting as the chuppah, the covering, and the book of the covenant as the ketubah, the marital agreement, the contract, the book to which they've said, I do. So either we will opt not to be part of this marital agreement or we have to embrace chapter 24. I, I opt to embrace chapter 24. Because it's part of who, our, who we are, of our identity, of our being, of our calling. So, with that in mind, which of the I do's are still applicable? They've said three times I do, but the book is a recording and evidence or documentation of the legally enforceable substance and weight of a matter which is the betrothal or marital agreement, but which of them are still in place? So imagine, after more than three decades of marital life, I go to my wife and say, can we renegotiate some of those I do's? 
Nou ja, hij heeft meest up hier en daar, but those are minor issues. But um, you know, like there are a few. Can we renegotiate those? Hmm. I don't think so. It might it might lead to my uh, to to my demise <laughs> and my early demise, shall we add? So. If I'm not prepared to do that with my wife and our marital agreement and the I do's, how can we say, let's negotiate these terms with our father? I mean, it just doesn't make sense. For the precise reason of what our Messiah Yeshua said in Matthew 12, and I quoted it earlier, said to him, every reign, every kingdom divided against itself is laid to waste, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. But his house shall stand, his kingdom is not divided, his word is not divided, he is one. And so is his agreement, his covenant, his marital agreement with us. So, Take it one step further then. So how the eternity of this covenant. The betrothal ceremony took place before the golden calf. The entire nation at that point in time was a nation of priests. Everyone. According to the order of Melchizedek, of which our Messiah Yeshua is the high priest. Moses and the young men of Israel operated under that priestly order. And that order is an everlasting order, Hebrews 7. That's the order in which you and I are functioning. We are in the order of Melchizedek priests. And that's what the whole book of Hebrews is also trying to tell us. And many other places. It's so important to realize in terms of the context that these events took place before the golden calf. The golden calf changed a few things, a lot of things, but these events and this marital agreement was signed under the Melchizedek order. If the betrothal and its ordinances were established under the everlasting Melchizedek priesthood, can it ever be undone? Unless if you take the book of Hebrews and everything around the, the order of Melchizedek and the high priest thereof away, which incidentally is our, our Messiah Yeshua, you can't. So chapter 24 is everlasting, binded by our high priest, Yeshua, under which authority Moses and the young men were operating that day. So, just a quick jump into then what happened with the golden calf, quick detour. Because of what happened, the tribe of Levi was taken out and was put in place to serve in the tabernacle as priests. That did not remove the order of Melchizedek. It's still continuing till today. And it's not an either or situation. Either this one or that one. It's a context matters. In a tabernacle, the Levites functioned as priests. In daily life, we operate as priests, but under his order, the Melchizedek order. Jeremiah, we've got this very interesting section. Thus is Jehovah the Elohim of Israel. I myself made a covenant with your fathers in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, saying, at the end of seven years, each one of you shall set free his Hebrew brother who has been a soul to him. And when he has served six years, you shall let him go free. But your fathers did not obey me. He's quoting from Exodus 21. He's quoting from this week's Torah portion. He's quoting from the Mishpatim. And he's saying, because your fathers did not obey me, you are profaning my name. So he's using Exodus 21 to accuse the, the fathers of not obeying and living according to the covenant. 
So at least it was lasting up until Jeremiah's time. As I've mentioned earlier, there's this very interesting sequence of events. And that the covenant um, was signed here in Exodus 19 to 24, culminating in Shavuot, the giving of the Torah, and then also later the, the Ruach HaKodesh. But right thereafter, the instructions of the design of the tabernacle. Because Moses then went up to be with the Father, where he then received the details of the, of the tabernacle, mostly of the discussions of next week's Torah portion, who must, what must stand where, and the, the, the dimensions thereof. So that's the betrothal that happened there. But then, right after the betrothal, a place for and a shadow of a spiritual reality where the nation of priests can worship and facilitate the worship of a holy elf. That's why we need a tabernacle. So that we can have a place where we can worship and be in relationship with the one within which we have been engaged in. And then later on, the construction thereof. And that tabernacle is then an exact replica of what is described in Revelations 4 and 5. Identical. So either chapters, Revelations chapters 4 and 5 is no longer applicable, or the design of the tabernacle is still very much applicable. The tabernacle, and we're going to read verses four, uh, chapters 4 and 5. Because our master has said, and they shall make me a set apart place, and I shall dwell in their midst, according to all that I show you, the pattern of the dwelling place, and the pattern of all its furnishings, make it exactly so. So the layout of the camp, we have the tabernacle in the middle, around it, the Levites and the priests, the priests over there, that's Aaron and his sons, and then the Levites around, and then to the north, a set of camps with Dan as the leader, to the west, Ephraim as the leader, to the south, Reuben as the leader, and to the east, with Judah as the leader. Which is basically a link now to the, what are the markers that I've put in place there. So that's a sort of out layout of the camp. In summary, if we take that very picture and we just put imagery with it, Dan has represented their banner uh, is an eagle, li- Judah is a lion, Reuben is the face of a man, and Ephraim is that of an ox. The tabernacle, we have the, the altar, the burnt offer altar. We have the bronze laver, which is also called the sea, the menorah, the table of showbread, altar of incense, which represents our prayers, and the covenant within the Holy of Holies. With to the south, Reuben, um, sorry, uh, um, Reuben, Ephraim, Dan, and Judah, towards the east. And in the addition, sorry, in addition, the breastplate of the high priest, the twelve stones for the twelve tribes, the Sardis for Reuben as the eldest, Emerald for Judah as the leader tribe, and Jasper for Benjamin as the youngest. Why I'm mentioning that is because we're going to see reflections of that now in and through Revelations. After this I looked and saw a door being having been opened in the heavens, and the first voice which I heard was like that of a trumpet. That's what we've read in chapter tw- Exodus chapter 20, the trumpet. Speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I shall show you what has to take place after this. And immediately I came into the Spirit, and I saw the throne of the heaven, and one who sat on the throne, and he who sat there was like Jasper, representing the youngest tribe, and the ruby, which is also a Sardius, a Sardius or a Carnelian, which is Reuben, the eldest, stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald, reflecting the leader tribe, Judah, in appearance. 
and around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting dressed in white robes, the priestly garments of the 24 priestly courses sitting around the tabernacle, as we have seen in the layout. And they had crowns of gold on their heads, and out of the throne came lightnings and thunders and voices, as we've heard in chapter 20 when we read chapter 20. And seven lamps, which is the menorah of fire, were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of, the, of Elohim. And before the throne were a sea of glass, which is the laver, like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures, covered with eyes in front and in the back. The first living creature was like a lion, a seraphim representing Judah. And the second creature like a calf representing Ephraim. And the third living creature had a face of a man representing Reuben. And the fourth living creature had a living, like a flying eagle representing Dan. And the four living creatures, each having six wings, were covered with eyes around and within. And they do not cease day or night saying, Kodesh, 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 Jehovah El Shaddai, who was and who is and who is coming. And when the living creatures gave esteem and respect and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders, the priests, fall down on their faces before him who sits on the throne and bow before him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Jehovah, to receive esteem and respect and power, for you have created it all. And because of you, your desire they are and were created. What a picture. If we put that into perspective, just some very elementary drawings to reflect what we've just read. A throne, and we've read about the stones, the jasper representing Benjamin, chameleon representing Reuben, emerald, Judah, the youngest, the eldest, the leader, everybody in terms of the nations represented there. But there was the thunder of the lightnings and the, and the sound thereof and that of the ram's horn that filled it. And we had the sea of glass, which is in the temple, the tabernacle, the laver. And we had the, the priests all around it. And we had the four living be uh, creatures, representing Dan, the eagle, Judah, represented by the lion, Reuben, the face of a man, and Ephraim, the ox. And so we see the design of the tabernacle and Revelations 4 and 5 to merge and to come together in a perfect harmony. How relevant is Exodus? And what our Father is trying to communicate to us through an everlasting covenant. Through the order of our High Priest, our Messiah. Chapter 5 And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a biblion, written inside and on the back, having been sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong messenger proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loosen its seals. And no one in the heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the biblion or to look at it. They couldn't even look at it. Never mind open it. Never mind touching it. They couldn't even look at it. And I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. And one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, overcame to open the scroll and to loosen its seven seals. If our Messiah Yeshua is not core and center of our worship, then it's religion. And I looked and saw in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders a lamb. Whew. Having been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of Elohim, sent out into the earth. And he came and he took the Biblion out of his right hand and of him sitting on the throne. And when he took the Biblion, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and a golden bowl 
filled with the incense which are the prayers of the set apart ones. And they sang under a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and have redeemed us to Elohim by your blood out of, uh, ev- out from every tribe and tongue and people and nation and made us sovereigns and priests. Where did we read that? Exodus 19. To our Elohim and we shall reign upon this earth. And looked, and I heard the voice of many messengers around the throne and living creatures and elders. And the number of them were myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb, having been slain to receive the power and the riches and the wisdom and the strength and respect and esteem and blessing. Can we just drink in what we just read? What those thousands and thousands and myriads and myriads are saying? Worthy is the Lamb, having been slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and respect and esteem and blessing. We can take nothing away from our Messiah. We cannot denounce him. We cannot say that he was just an interesting prophet. We cannot say anything about him other than to say, Worthy is the Lamb having been slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and respect and esteem and blessing. Come, Yeshua, come. Fill every part of our lives. And every creature which is in the heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such that are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, to him sitting on the throne and to, he, and to the Lamb be the blessing and the respect and the esteem and the might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the twenty-four elders fell down and bowed before him who lives forever and ever. The tabernacle was given to be a shadow of this. So, where's the tabernacle today? So the question is, are we a shadow of this? Because that's the challenge. If we are the tabernacle of our Father through the Holy Spirit, which we are, then this, we should reflect this. We should reflect this honor, this glory, this respect, this esteem, this majesty to our Father. That which was the earthly tabernacle had to do, and which purpose it did fulfill while it was here, as we would have will see in future also in Exodus chapter 40, when the glory of our Father dwell in the tabernacle and is physically manifested here. That same glory is not divided. It's not yesterday, today, tomorrow the same. Should be reflected through our lives. We should be the ones singing, Worthy is the Lamb having been slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and respect and esteem and blessings. Why are we the ones that should sing that as well? As it is in heaven, let it be on earth. We are represented in heaven by one of the seraphim. Why are we represented by one of the seraphim? Because they represent all the tribes. All the tribes are represented in heaven. One of those seraphim is representing me and you. We know what he is doing at this very moment. Falling before the throne, bringing glory and honor to the Father. And so likewise shall we do. That's the picture from Revelation 4. But we can add to it some elements from Revelation 5 the harp and the altar of incense being the prayers bringing glory and honor and majesty and worship to our Father and add the Lamb as slain worthy to open the scroll and we've got a complete picture for us to gain an understanding of what 
is awaiting us in the heavens. And what John saw, our father shared with Moses. Our father saw it. And as we start to understand the depth and the wisdom and the information contained in the book of Exodus and then later on, we will start to grasp an element of what this is trying to communicate with us. But we have to distinguish between form and function. And with this I will conclude. Form refers to structure. It answers the how, the when, and the where questions. How big? How long? How deep? How high? What color? How many of this? How many of that? And the function refers to the purpose. The why. We need the structure. We need the form. But if we only focus on the form, the how, the when, and the where, and not and miss the function, the purpose, then we've missed it completely. So we need the form to provide us with a context within which we can see the function, the purpose, to come to the fore. Because eventually, it is about the purpose. And the answer is given to us. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and have redeemed us to Elohim by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and made us sovereigns and priests to our Elohim and we shall reign upon the earth. Therefore, worthy is the Lamb, having been slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and respect and esteem and blessing. To him sitting on the throne and to the Lamb be the blessing and the respect and the esteem and the might forever and ever. Set apart, Kodesh, 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 Jehovah El Shaddai, who was, who is, and who is coming. The purpose, the function, is worship. The Afrikaans word unbidden is actually more descriptive. Our lives being one of complete devotion in the morning, in the car, at the work, when we engage with people, when we are going through the trials and tribulations and tests, worship in complete set-apartness. And only when we say, I do to that, and being willing to do so, and as we grow in that, His glory will fill the place. Because that's where He will dwell. And then we will be clothed by Him and by His majesty. As I've mentioned, the connection between Exodus and the Exodus story and the Revelations is absolutely remarkable. It's one story. Next week we will look at the same, but through the eyes of Paul. And we will realize that Paul was just bringing glory and honor and praise to our Father. Thank you, Father, that you have given us your word. Thank you that you have established us in an eternal covenant, and one that cannot be broken. One which we commemorate year after year after year with at Shavuot. That you've given us your precious word, your Torah, and you've sealed it with your Holy Spirit so that your glory can rest among your people, as has been evidenced in Exodus chapter 4. As we are reading from the book of Revelations, and we pray that you will dwell among us by your Holy Spirit, through your Holy Spirit. We pray that you will guide us deeper into the understanding of your tabernacle, and of bringing off, you know, live lives completely devoted to you and only to you. 
and by us living according to your principles, loving you, be a blessing also to the nations, a light to the nations, so that they can be drawn to you. While our focus is not on the darkness and the kingdom of darkness and the disputes and the divisions in the kingdom of darkness, but our focus is on you, our Messiah Yeshua, the Lamb slain. And we praise your name. Come Yeshua. Amen.